Jesus' name, we've got to cure it. If one would look at Marxism and Leninism, one of its political plans is atheism. Atheism doesn't mean that you don't believe in God. Atheism means that you affirm that God does not exist. And they told me as a young man, if I wanted to organize in their party as a Marxist Leninist, I had to go before my people and insist that my people deny the existence of God before they struggle. Can you see this? Can you imagine me going into a southern church where the only place for me? <laughs> okay, we're ready to fight, but you all got to throw away. You know what the old people used to tell me? We have such a strong belief in God that old people used to tell me, son, if God ain't in this movement, I ain't in it. God, if son ain't leading, if God ain't leading it, I ain't marching. I'll never forget once in a demonstration where all the women was marching. My heart felt pity for her. I came to her, I said, uh, I think you ought to just uh, not sure. I'm marching, son. I said, but you know, it's uh, going to be rough in that prison, and even if you're old, they, they don't care. I don't care, son. I ain't got nothing to worry about. I'm going to jail today. I got a telephone in my bosom. As soon as they put me in jail, I'm calling up Jesus. He's going to take care of me. <laughs> people to come and insist that this cultural plant, which is alien to them, is just to make errors. Your ideology must come from your own culture. That's why the All African People's Revolutionary Party has been affirming that ecumenism, tourism is our only ideology because it comes from our culture. Indeed, your actions must give thought, you must give rise to your thoughts. It is from your actions that you must get theory to direct you. You can't have actions and somebody else bring their theory and give it to you. It will never work. We say that we've advanced to Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. We are socialists here. We are socialists. And we will never get confused by others. The white left itself make great errors, European Marxist Leninists. They even make statements, and I've read them in great revolutionary books, that Karl Marx founded socialism. This can never be. Never be. Socialism is a universal truth. Nobody can found it. We can never say that Newton founded the laws of gravity. We can say he observed it and recorded it correctly. That's all. As a matter of fact, if I'm a peasant in Timbuktu in West Africa, studying the laws of gravity, never having heard anything about Sir Isaac Newton, I will come to the exact same conclusions that he did. A body falls at the rate of 32 feet per second squared per second squared. If I've never heard of Karl Marx, I'm a peasant sitting in Libya in the desert, looking at the relationship between labor and capital, I come to the exact same conclusion that Marx did, that wherever capital tries to dominate labor, there'll be a ceaseless, uncompromising, relentless struggle by labor until it smashes capitalism and comes to dominate it. Karl Marx cannot found this. Like Newton, he can observe and directly record. But independent of them too, I, as a human being, just like them, can come to the same discovery that they did. This must be properly understood. The American capitalist system seeks to confuse people. That's its job. As a matter of fact, in the past years, it made it appear as if the Soviet Union and socialism were one and the same. Thus, when the problems arise in the Soviet Union, they can quickly claim to all the world, socialism is dead, it is crumbled. Look at this stupidity. As if anyone judges a system by its adherence. All systems are judged by their principles, never by their adherence. Tell me which of you in this room judges Christianity by Christians? <laughs> Indeed, were we to judge Christianity by Christians, it crumbled with Judas. Perhaps the difference between Judas and Gorbachev is clear. At least Judas had the dignity to hang himself. This big and traitor, Gorbachev, still walks around, lacking all dignity. So some people come to think that, oh, the Soviet Union's collapsed. No, the socialists never. I have never looked to Europe for any direction on socialism at all. When they were there, we worked with them, and we knew their errors. They attacked us everywhere, called us national, nano nationalists, chauvinists, this, that, everything, because we would not accept their lie. We are independent thinkers here. And it's stupid for us to think that our people only have actions, and we must get theories from somebody else, that we not fight. We'll always fight to think independently for ourselves on behalf of our people's struggle. This is crucial, and this point must be properly understood as a qualifying point from the 60s. And Africanism is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism, and Africa will be the first unified socialist continent. Hear me well. Hear me properly. We know that Europe is making talk about they will be a united continent by 1992. They will never unify before Africa. No way. I give you historical, political, and cultural proof. If you will read bourgeois historical
to your newspapers and your televisions, you will hear European leaders, like even Mr. Major, come before the people of Europe and say, you know, this thing, European Continental Union, is not good for us. It could hurt our economy. It could damage our tourism. It could be against our agriculture. But no African leader, yeah, he will, not even the scum of our race, who is actively working to sabotage African unity, can ever come before the masses of the people and say, I'm against African unity for any reason. No, they must lie. They must say, I'm for African unity. They must say, we must go slow. But they can never say they're against it. Even though they work against it, they have before the people to come and say they're for it because the pressure on African unity is so strong among the masses. Finally, in the cultural arena, the most important on the mass base, I have heard songs sang about England, about France, about Germany, but I've never heard one song sung about Europe. Not, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I've never heard it. But the songs I've heard about Africa, I can stop with Bob Marley alone. Everywhere the African people sing of Africa, no matter where they're born, whether it's Jamaica, whether it's America, whether it's Africa, whether it's Europe. And finally, to show the strength of this, I have never seen anybody wear a map of Europe around their neck. <laughs> I don't even know what it looks like. <laughs> but everywhere you go, you will find somebody with a map of Africa around their neck. This cultural basis must be properly understood. Indeed, the reason why they think that Africa will not unite is because our evolutionary process towards continental unity, which is innate to all people, have been interrupted by colonialism and slavery. And they thought by interrupting this evolutionary process that our zeal, our enthusiasm, our determination for a unified continent would somehow disappear. He said the people have an instinctive love of justice. And length of time does not quench it, it in fact intensifies it. Since our evolutionary process has been interrupted, the only way we can arrive at continental unity is through <coughs> revolution. This then must be properly understood. This call for revolution is not a bloodthirsty call. It is a scientifically, historically determined call based on the fact that African unity was interrupted by imperialism and is still interrupted by imperialism. Martin Luther King told us that justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Africa's unification is stopped by all backward forces, all reactionary forces, by imperialism, by capitalism, by colonialism, by neocolonialism, and by Zionism. Of course, this aspect of Zionism must be properly understood. We are not confused at all. I'm anti-Zionist. I shall be until I die, or it is destroyed. That is the plan. I will tell everybody that I'm anti-Zionist. I will not even hesitate. But I assure you that your priest, press people, will write tomorrow that I'm anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. They will never say I'm anti-Zionist. This is what I say. This is what I say. Of course, they're lying. I can never be anti-Semitic, not me. Our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, gives unconditional support to the Palestinian people, just like America gives unconditional support to the Zionist state of Israel. I've had the pleasure, the opportunity, the privilege of working with Yasser Arafat and of working on projects with him. And as long as we live, we'll continue to work together and meet together. I have a great deal of respect, admiration, and love for Yasser Arafat. The Palestinian people are Semites. They are a Semitic people. Because how can I be anti-Semitic when I support them? As for being anti-Judaic, this is an insult to our culture. We gave Judaism to the world, this is clear. But even if you don't know this, one thing you must know about the African people is that they are very religious people and they will never have a hearing given to them, they'll never have a hearing by anyone who's anti-religious. Consequently, when they say that Farrakhan is anti-Jude, no, no, he could never be anti-anything religious in front of our people. They wouldn't listen to him. Our people are religious people. Matter of fact, some of us think they're too religious. But it is clear of the religious aspect. How can I be anti-Judaic? My people gave Judaism to the world. I can never be against what my people did. I'm a conscious African. As a matter of fact, I'm proud. But I am anti-Zionist, and you must not get confused. Of course, you don't read, so you don't know anything about the forces that control your lives. <laughs> the capitalist system directs your energies towards frivolity, away from the forces that affect your life. That's the very struggle to redress yourself. Just one example, and you should read it about this, this Zionism, this is satanic system. The founder of political Zionism was a man called Theodore Herzl, H-E-R-Z-L. You ought to read. You ought to read. You ought to stop looking and stop looking at that idiot box 
so much and read. Put something in your head. <laughs> and that person once told me, if you have a son, you can give him money. When you die, they can feed it. If you have a son, you can build him a house. When you die, it can burn up. Once you put something in his head, nothing can take it. Thank you. 
unique problems? <laughs> Same problem you got, everybody else got. Matter of fact, to solve it, let's you come together with those trying to solve it and solve it to you. Well, you know, Brother Kwame, I don't know about the people, but I'm not against, I'm not against them, I'm not against them, you know. I, I don't work for the FBI, I don't say nothing against the people. If your people are oppressed and you are not making a contribution to alleviate their suffering, you are against the people. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. If your mother is being raped and you can help and you put your hands behind your back and say, I ain't got nothing to do with this, you're against your mother. If your people are being oppressed everywhere and you put your hands behind your back and say, I ain't got nothing to do with this, you're against your people. It's as simple as that. This understanding of the need for the masses to come and bring their full energy into the struggle must be properly comprehended in the 90s. Properly comprehended. The statement then is clear, we say it all the time. If your people are oppressed, by your very act of inaction, you are against your people. And do not think inaction is not an action. Some of you may think that inaction doesn't mean an action. It's an action, Jack. But we say you do two things here, either consciously or unconsciously. It's as simple as that. Africa is going to be free, unified, socialist. We must qualify the movement from the 60s to the 90s. Pan Africanism calls for the reconstruction of Africa. We're speaking here of reconstruction the base of world civilization. And Africanism calls for the reconstruction of Africa. We're speaking here of reconstructing the very base of world civilization. This cannot be done haphazardly and spontaneously. It can only be done in an organized manner. A confused young brother, not being conscious, but only listening to television, came to tell me the other day, oh, Father Kwame, I'm so sorry, I was around in the 60s. I said, oh, why is that? It's because you were so organized. We were not organized in the 60s, we were mobilized. There's a big difference between mobilization and organization, a very big difference. And this difference must be properly comprehended by those of us who wish to make a contribution to our people's struggle, qualifying every day the struggle. We must not seek mobilization in the 90s, we must seek organization. <coughs> There's a big difference. Go yourself and look at the organizations that played a role in the 1960s. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Student Nonviolent Court Committee. Take SNCC. Do you know in SNCC at no time did we have more than 300 members of our organization? At no time did we have more than 300. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference by Dr. Martin Luther King had even less. These are facts. We didn't have organizations. These organizations mobilized the masses of the people. And this mobilization is temporary, of course. It spins itself out, of course. We must have organization. That is to say, the masses of the people in the 60s participated in activity, not in organizations. There must be no confusion here. There must be no confusion here. Oh, man, you know the 60s, Brother Kwame, you were down, weren't we? Brother, what organization do you belong to? Yeah, we were down, Brother Kwame, we were down. <laughs> I can't tell you. All my life, I belong to organizations. All my life. I will never be confused by the enemy. I know that there's no such thing as Rambo or Superman when it comes to the people's liberation. <laughs> Indeed, if one man can free the people, I'd have done it long time ago. <laughs> but only the people can free the people. We have demonstrated that the advancement we make in this country is based on mass struggle, nothing but mass struggle. Thus, if this is based on mass struggle, it is clear the only way we can advance ourselves is through mass struggle. This mass struggle cannot be spontaneous. It must be organized. To go from human rights in the 60s to Pan-Africanism in the 90s called for organizing the masses of our people. Of course, some people are just afraid of the masses. Oh, they got guns. That's what I want. <laughs> oh, they got guns and they shoot each other. I know they shoot each other. All we got to show them who the enemy is. The problem is regular. The problem is regular. Oh, you know, people down there, they this, they that. The illiterate masses are the ones who make history, them and them alone. The ones for whom you have contempt, they're the only makers of history. And they must be organized. And there must be plans turning to students that they have a responsibility here. We know that no individual in this country, African, receives any position without the blood of the people. I mean, even this big judge, whatever his name is in the Supreme Court, Thomas, he didn't arrive there on his own pulling his truth up. It was the blood of his people that made it possible.
must be properly understood. That means as students, you have a direct responsibility to the masses in your people. We are revolutionaries here from the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We're not reformists. Reform will never solve our problem. Capitalism cannot be reformed. It must be destroyed. And it will be destroyed of that there isn't the slightest question. We say we're not reformists here, we are revolutionaries. We are revolutionaries seeking the total liberation of our people. And we understand that our people can never be liberated until their homeland, Africa, is liberated. We understand that these people cannot be liberated until every people among them is making their proper contribution for the liberation of the people. Simply put, until you are working for us, 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 until all of us are working for us, we will not be free. Revolutions are made by three segments of society, workers, peasants, and revolutionary intelligentsia. We have said that our people have unity of action. They lack unity of thought. The masses of our people are always ready for struggle. Indeed, all over the world wishes to be found. They are always betrayed by the intelligentsia. The petty bourgeoisie. From the French Revolution to the 1960s, you will see everywhere our struggle betrayed by those who get positions based on the blood of the people and then come to tell the people, all right, I may have cool it, everything is all right, I take it. <laughs> These positions must be used to push the people to higher forms of struggle. David Dinkins in New York should be done as by him, Mayor of New York. He should be organizing us to continue the struggle in New York. Here, these betrayers, after arriving at the position, come to stop struggle. They're the first enemies of the people. We get nothing in the world without struggle. Our culture itself demonstrates this. If you take someone as sickening as Michael Jackson, I am sure that if you would ask him what he's doing, he would think he's doing something. Say, but now Michael Jackson, these people are oppressed, Jack. They suffer 24 hours a day.
this body, the interest of the masses of the people must reign supreme over every individual interest that you have. We are a revolutionary body. As a matter of fact, our body seeks to strengthen the weaknesses of our people. When you come into our body, for the first six months, you do absolutely nothing except read. Did you hear me? All we do is make you read. Five pages a day. The effect is clear here. We want you to become systematic readers for your people. After all, if you're not studying for your people, who's going to study for George Bush? Let's be serious here. Yeah. We must study for the people, and it's we and we alone who will study for them. And you have the ability to rapidly, to rapidly digest ideas based on your literary skills must come to rapidly get these ideas for the people. It's your task. You must understand precisely your mission. Perhaps the man, the great pan Africanist, said, Each generation must find out what its mission is, either fulfill it or betray it. Do you know some don't even try to find out what their mission is? You must come to help organize the people. We always say, We want you to join the organization, but we tell you, ours is a revolutionary organization. You may not want it, no problem with us. If you don't join our organization, you better join another organization working for your people. We tell you all the time, if you don't belong to the All African People's Revolutionary Party, you should belong to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. If you don't belong to that, you should belong to the Nation of Islam. If you don't belong to that, you should belong to the Black Liberation Army. If you don't belong to that, you should belong to the Urban League. If you don't belong to that, you should belong to some organization working for your people. And if all the organizations out here do not, as far as you can see, map out the correct path for liberation, then you, like any other conscious African, has the responsibility to create the organization that will lead the people to their liberation. Everybody must belong to an organization. Go among your colleagues. You will find all of them belong to some organization. We're the only ones that belong to it. And you know, we say the capitalist system makes you arrogant in your stupidity. Yeah, we don't need no organization. What do people do for me? <laughs> Student told me that. In college, what the people did for me? Boy, they should have shed your blood. You need me shining shoes at this campus. What I got to give to the people? Anyway, you know, what about me? organization, you know, all our leaders are corrupt. You're a Christian? Yeah. You go to church? Yeah. You preach to drive the Cadillac? Yeah. You give them collection? Yeah. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus wore sandals. Take that. Brother said, we know Brother Kwame, all our organizations are bad. That's correct. But we are so badly disorganized that that organization is better than no organization at all. We will never cease organizing our people and raising our voices to encourage the masses of our people to organize us because we know organization is an indispensable prerequisite for liberation. The only thing standing between you and liberation is the organization of the masses of your people. The only thing standing between you and liberation is the organization of the masses of your people. <clears throat> we have done our task. Of course, we will continue to organize our people. I've said from the time I was young, I've been a member of an organization. I've been expelled from some that I helped to build. Others which I worked for threatened to kill me. But before I was expelled, or before I resigned, I was already in another organization. It is only organization that will free us. If we can give you any messages, this. Anyway, let me tell you, your people will be free. Of that, there isn't the slightest question. All people will be free. The only question you must ask yourself is what contribution will I make to my people's noble and sacred struggle? Thank you. Ready for the record. Unfortunately, 
uh, could not answer that question uh, quietly, but we can say this, that uh, Brother Huey P. Newton was a man for whom we've always had a great deal of respect. But if you will look properly, properly at the history of the Black Panther Party, not all this garbage that I was a Black Panther, but properly and correctly, you will see that when Huey Newton was arrested for shooting a policeman, killing a policeman, that the Black Panther Party in California had only seven members. The party was built by Edward Cleaver and Bobby C. And today they're not in struggle anymore. So uh, the contradictions in that party was great. I recognize the task of politically educating the masses in the Black Panther Party, and at every attempt I was blocked, either by Edward Cleaver or by Bobby C. In fact, at one time, you told me, you ain't nothing but a bourgeois college kid. That's right, Jack, an honor roll student in philosophy. You did that. <laughs> I give it all to the people, but you give it. So uh, the struggle there was great, and the only way that uh, the struggle could have been resolved was through a shootout. That simply made no sense at all. So uh, all we had to do there was to resign, knowing that I would fall apart quickly and move on to other organizations. By the time we resigned, we were already members of the All African People's Revolution. That was 1967. Uh, the fact that it uh, collapsed shows it. Uh, Huey Newton, of course, uh, was a strong brother, but uh, unfortunately, in his later years, uh, in many conversations with him, he didn't recognize the responsibility, the necessity for organization, but he had a provider about him. You know, if you would look at his record, police in the Bay Area did everything against him, and they were so stupid, they couldn't make anything stick. They charged him for murder of a prostitute, couldn't make it stick. They used to put him in jail all the time. Every time I see him, I'd say, look, man, why don't you leave? Get out of here. Ah, oh, this is my neighborhood. There ain't nobody run me out. Until the police killed him. The police did kill Huey Newton. Others can talk all the garbage they want to talk. Just like the FBI killed King, the police killed Newton. I don't care who pulled the trigger, the police did it. And uh, the others, like we say, I don't know what uh, Elvis Steve is doing today, but I know he ain't doing nothing for the people. I don't know what Bobby C will do, but I know he ain't do nothing for the people. Because there ain't none of them in an organization. As a matter of fact, they're not even ashamed to talk about how they deserted the people's trouble. In the 1960s, I was out there. Yeah, all right. So uh, the Black Panther Party itself, if you look at it and properly study it, you must study its history. Don't just get little phrases here and think that's the history. You will study it, you will see properly that uh, its major contradiction came from these two people who must bear total responsibility for its direction and for its. Uh, this person. <clears throat> Send them uh, 
revolutionary pants. We must let them know that uh, organization is not up for the grabs or for the influence by any liberals. It's only up for those who struggle, and there's a massive of people. They're the only struggles, actually. Um, I would like to address the issue of economic security. As you know, our government graciously has stated that they will help small businesses, and they will give you funds for that. How do you address that, and how would you define, or what would you suggest um, people of color do, or those who are in the struggle do, to get that? country, 
you will see after the Civil War there appeared something called the Populist Party. Have you ever heard of the Populist Party? And you will know here, it was an example. Of course, it was betrayed by uh, Tom Watson and others who became members of Ku Klux Klan. But uh, if you look carefully, it's the only alliance that can occur between the poor whites and Africans. And do you know, all the white liberals in this country do not take time out to organize poor whites, and they need to be organized. So do not think in any way that I am excluding you. On the contrary, matter of fact, you have big tasks on your hands if you're serious, the organization of the poor whites in this country. And the task is clear. If I could organize them, I would have done it. But uh, racism is a factor, so many other factors, and keep it. But uh, I think you can make a great contribution here, and I'm being serious. I don't want you to think in any way I'm being uh, flippant. Not at all. I'm being serious. As a matter of fact, as chairperson of SNCC, one of our first tasks is to put white people out of organization. Everybody's screaming, but this was exactly what we said. Go and organize these four whites in the South, because only the Ku Klux Klan is organizing them. There's no alternative force. They need one. Can we keep that? <laughs> this is where the economically insecure and the economically insecure can really form coalitions. And I want to tell you seriously that I have a great deal of uh, feelings and sympathy for the poor whites. Because I think that they are more oppressed, believe it or not, than we Africans. Because at least we know there's oppression, so we're suspicious. But they're the ones who do this Rambo stuff all over the world, get America strong and come back and get absolutely nothing for it. <coughs> Consequently, the poor whites need to be organized in this country, and I throw up a challenge to all whites who say that we've put them out of the movement, or oh, there's no place for them in the African Revolution. There's a great place for you to organize poor whites, and they must be organized. Thank you.